performance of the super exclusive Cobra R with all the amenities you expect in a Cobra. This is the car Cobra enthusiasts have been waiting for. Cobra's 32-valve 4.6-liter V8 is now supercharged and intercooled, which provides a huge increase in power and torque. Cobra's driveline and chassis have been upgraded to handle the increased power output to ensure Cobra maintains its trademark balanced performance. And Cobra gets a fresh new look inside and out to go with its newfound performance. The 2003 SVT Mustang Cobra is an authentic American muscle car. Good day and welcome to Firebird International Raceway. I'm Rick Titus. Well, you've got a busy day ahead of you, but it's my job to kind of introduce you to the, to the Cobra. Well, <laughs> if introduce may be a generous term at least walk you through what are a lot of significant technical changes in the 03 model. I'm a Mustang fan, not like a million other Americans, a pretty hardcore Mustang enthusiast. I get to speak to a lot of Mustang car clubs throughout the country throughout the year. My radio show also takes on Mustangs as, as a theme from time to time, so it's a package I'm pretty familiar with. I'll be honest with you, I've seen as many good Mustangs as I've seen bad. There's a lot of people in the aftermarket that really don't understand this chassis. We think it's all about just adding hardware. I will give credit to SVT. They really have done an excellent job in refining the existing package and, and quite frankly, developing the art form to a whole new level. Shockingly enough, to take a good Mustang and make it a world-class production sports car, that's not so easy. SVT has done that. That moniker about, well, performance, substance, exclusivity, and value proves just as true here as it does through any SVT product. And let's face it, the most famous of those three has clearly got to be the Cobra. To that end, I'm going to head and start with engines. Of course, we're using the 4.6 liter V8 that most of you are familiar with. We are using a dual overhead cam version. We are using a, well, a cast iron block. That's a change. Alloy heads. We have stuck with multi-valve, which I'm a big fan of because of the inhale and exhale efficiencies of going that route. The horsepower numbers take a significant bump, 390. Yes, folks, that puts you in the world-class league now. 390 horsepower, 390 foot-pounds of torque, which just makes this thing flat lovely to drive no matter what speed range you've got the chassis in. There's a lot of key reasons for the change in horsepower, principally related to the, to the supercharger unit. Most of you know that's an Eaton unit. We've been using Eaton's for a while now. Well, it's a root-style blower, but well, other gains, and by the way, since we're looking real quickly, let me just remind you how important it's going to be for your sales consultants to make an issue about underhood appearance. SVT has been very sensitive to making sure this thing, well, writes a check it can cash both in terms of performance and appearance. That's key. should also remind you that the SVT motors go down what we refer to as our niche line at the Romeo plant. And how important is this to the consumer? Well, guess what? The technicians that actually assemble the motor actually sign the engine. I think that's something our sales consultants should remind our people of. This kind of enthusiast loves those kind of details. I do want to expand a little bit with you with regarding the supercharger unit. I've taken the liberty over here of removing one, turning it upside down. I just want to remind you about that because most people don't expect to see this amount of hardware underneath the supercharger sitting inside that intake manifold. But this little piece right here known as an intercooler, really key to the big horsepower gain and I think to a large degree even the, the, the refinement of the drivability. Now an intercooler has an interesting job, I should tell you. First of all, this is what they call a water to air cooler. It actually uses a separate coolant source to run through this cooler. So that as air comes through it, we actually exchange heat out of the air, put it in the water, and then cool that separately. Here's where it's important. As you can see here, we take air, bring it into the supercharger. You know there's impellers here that squish that air together, crush that air together. We want to take a volume of air this big, put it in an area that big, so the boom, when we actually ignite that with fuel, is stronger, but we've learned there's even ways to make that more efficient because as you compress that air, as you rub those molecules pretty tightly and pack them together, they gain heat. Well, yeah, that's, that's acceptable, but if you're really looking for the ultimate refinement, why not take some of that heat out of here, and as, those, as that charge comes through, they're all compressed, all hot, and on its way to the combustion chamber, what if we actually now enlarge those molecules by cooling them? 
This improves the density of the charge, gives us a far more effective combustion range, really does enhance the drivability, and it's a big boost at the moment of fire when you actually go to get the power. This thing does a really important job. This is a nice add-on detail, help the vehicle a whole bunch. Beyond that, other big gains, when you drive really sophisticated world-class cars, and, and for all too long, the brute V8s of Detroit were often relying on just their large engine size to make them feel powerful. But if you drive even smaller, world-class refined cars, one of the things that tells you they're refined is their snappy throttle response. To that end, not only the supercharger, which thank, frankly is faster in reaction than, let's say, a turbo, but they've also got an aluminum flywheel. Really allows the engine to spin up very quickly. They stuck with a single disc clutch, a single plate clutch. I'm glad of that. There's a temptation in the aftermarket now to push on and you can hear what's going on in the background here. You know, being at a racetrack here at Firebird, of course, uh, you got John Force practicing with the NHRA drag Mustangs that he runs in a funny car. And of course, we've got the Bonron School practicing. So you'll hear all manner of noise, probably while you're here as well. Now, beyond that, I just want to talk about that single disc clutch. A lot of aftermarket people want to push those multi-disc clutches to people. Yeah, in terms of just sheer brute ability to take horsepower connected to the gearbox, they're effective. To drive at low speed, they're bloody awful. They're just awful. Very difficult not to stall, very difficult to engage smoothly. I'm glad that this SVT group said, look, let's just put a single disc in there, just make it the kind of force that will connect our power. Now, in terms of connecting our power to what? Well, we're going to a T56, five, uh, six speed, excuse me, a six speed gearbox. Now, I'm certain to some people that looks like, well, a gear for gear's sake, not at all. Anytime you add a gear stack, it allows you to close up the ratios of the existing gear stacks. And one of the well, refinements that you feel in driving the new Cobra for 03 is just how neatly spaced the gear spacing is and how the motor stays right in its power band. That enhances drivability, and I gotta tell you, it really does, in fact, enhance performance. So, a real neat, clean ratio there. They've gone to an aluminum drive shaft. That's new also for 03. Kind of key on a number of areas. Remember, drive shafts are very long, fairly bulky item, but it's also spinning very rapidly. So, we not only reduce vehicle weight, we actually reduce the inertia weight by rotation. So, good gain there. Course into our famous 8.8 inch rear end. <laughs> yeah, now I'd love to tell you that was this thing, but that'd be a little brutal for the street. That's John Forrest getting ready for a pass. No, we're going into a limited slip traction control differential. Beyond that, of course, we have a two length exhaust system with very unique and interesting exhaust tips out the back that say right up front, this puppy's ready to go to work. Now, being a road racer by background, my father was the first Mustang driver driving for Shelby to win Mustang a championship back in 65 at the national level. In 67, he did it again at the Trans Am series at the pro level. And 20 years later to that day, in 87, I was able to do it in the Mustang as well at the pro level. So, been around these cars a lot, really kind of a road racer at heart. I'm a big fan of what SVT's done on all four corners. Again, Transforming a Mustang into a world-class car required a lot of homework in terms of suspension design. Yeah, Mustang's a pretty good base handler, but to really come to world-class standards, that's a little trickier deal. To do that, on the coupe, 600-pound springs all the way around. A little softer on the convertible, which makes sense to me. They've also gone to Bilstein shocks, and i got to tell you, of all the places you wouldn't think there'd be so much homework associated with it, the shocks really require a lot of tuning. It is the absolute fine-tuning point in the suspension system. I think this package works out really well. Of course, Goodyear tires at 17-inch level, <laughs> 275, 40 series, Z-speed rated tires. So serious, uh, serious hunks of rubber on the road, which is good. That's why this car is so responsive and has so much lateral cornering power. I'm a big fan of this five-spoke wheel design. I understand that's probably subjective because of the appearance. But beyond that, I love how it helps ventilate the brakes in terms of getting heat off these Brimbro 13-inch diameter fully vented rotors. Yeah, Mustang with stopping force. You know, if your customers or even yourself get an opportunity to go to track days or certain clubs or get any time on a racetrack at all, there's nothing more satisfying than the car that only goes like stink, corners like stink, but it'll actually slow down like that as well. Good job here. Of course, these are PBR twin piston clamp force uh, calipers on the front. Again, a car that comes standard with ABS, four-channel ABS, uh, you would expect that. With regard to stabilizer bars, the front tubular bar, nice lightweight bar, is 29 millimeter. The rear bar is 26 millimeter. Now, the rear is where an awful lot goes on. The big transformation for Cobra, of course, is from live axle to independent rear suspension. This is absolutely key, although outrageously expensive in terms of hardware. I think a key engineering change in what makes this chassis just transform into world class. Going independent rear was, I just think, essential. 
To do that, a big packaging change in the rear, of course, independent control of the tires, and a big advantage for putting power down. Mustangs have always been capable of making horsepower, but horsepower you can get to the earth has long been the challenge. As a longtime live axle Mustang racer, this was perhaps one of the most frustrating things about a Mustang. You could whistle in with just about anybody. You could, through the duration of the corner, hang on to just about everybody. But unfortunately, leaving, we were really at a weakness if there was any kind of sine wave or bump, bumps in the track. This really makes a big difference. And in the real world, where there's nothing but bumps, going to IRS was a smart move. Now, there's also been a gear ratio change from the final drive for the rear end. They've gone to 355. Now, I know this was talked about in a lot of different circles. I think in terms of overall driving enhancement, 355 was a smart ratio to go to in the rear. Of course, a, an 11.65 diameter disc in the rear, also vented. This is from the GT line. And again, a really good job of getting a lot of uh, hot air off the, off the rear brakes. I want to remind you, the other gains made in going to independent rear suspension, it allows to put more brake force on the rear wheels. So again, the stopping force really is enhanced overall. We were able to reduce the dive in the chassis and the squat, so the car is flatter even in cornering, acceleration, and in braking. Good execution. Now, body lines are absolutely essential to this buyer. And again, I realize it's a fairly subjective dialogue. But to look refined, well, generally, it doesn't look like a bunch of lick'em and stick'ems. There are people out there manufacturing fiberglass for Mustangs that make the thing look like it's been in a car wreck. I think if you really want to take the art form to the edge to show people this is a refined vehicle, I think the sculpting is outstanding. Now, a couple of cases where form really followed function. It was important to get more air in for cooling. The lower balance area and front spoiler of Cobra does a really good job of that. Of course, you'll recognize the signature round fog lamps. They're just part of the package anymore that people expect. There are key changes in the hood. And again, another case of form following function. We were able to take more air in. Well, you don't want to leave it in here. So guess what? These vents now exhale it out the top of the hood. It's not only good for high speed stability, that's good for cooling as well. I love the lower chin spoiler. Again, tolerant to some level of abuse, but more importantly, just kind of finishes off that finished look. Subtly, not overstating what the product is. And again, the vertical scoop, a really smart move in getting away from anything too gaudy in terms of a rear spoiler or a wing. They went to a subtle rear spoiler that you can actually go to delete on if the customer chooses to. And of course, a specific and unique rear balance. Well, other key transformations on the interior. If you've been a long time Mustang pilot, Nothing was scarier than somebody saying, hey, why don't we take a three-hour ride in a Mustang? <laughs> yeah, yeah that'd be fine if we can stop twice, because generally Mustang seats have not been historically very comfortable. Well, a big change here. You've got excellent lateral support, and the lower back support's completely different. I'm glad to see them go to a specific touring seat to what is obviously one of our most important buyers in terms of driving the car for long times. Of course, the gauges are specific to it, shifter as well, and the pedals. I can't emphasize the importance enough of making sure the pedal package works. The drivability of a car, particularly to an enthusiast, really rests on their ability to manipulate the controls at their feet. And a dead pedal, a place to actually rest your foot, your clutch foot, under hard cornering. This car makes massive cornering forces. It's really uncomfortable in a strain and tiring not to be able to plant that left leg. I think they did a really good job there as well. You know, I often tell people it ain't just about hardware. It's how you mix and blend that hardware. It's the balance of what you, what you target and how you execute. So many people in the aftermarket tuner business lose sight of the overall goal, that the car has to be compliant to the road surface, which is not like a pool table. The power has to be usable all the time, not just an 80 mile hour car that now gets a lung and scoots like stink, but something you can drive away from a stoplight and it still feels refined. A gearbox and a shifter setup that really feels good, that's actually fun to actuate. And just a whole ergonomic message sent to you from the interior in the form of lateral support, a steering wheel that feels sporty, read back from the front end that tells you the right message. In short, um, just a plethora of details that tells you in the end what was the bottom line. Did you make an A? Because most don't. For 03, the new Cobra is definitely.